ahead and get started here. My name is Emily Springer. I'm an academic trainer in the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am so thrilled to have one of our own NCU alumni come back. She is amazing in her presentations. We value her, Dr. Samantha Hedgepeth. Uh, we are thrilled to have you come back again. A couple, couple of things. Um, we have just as a brief reminder, we are recording this webinar and we will post it in our CTL webinars LibGuide page. And we absolutely want you to have conversation in the chat. So please feel free to do that. If you do want everyone to see your comment in the chat, make sure you select the everyone option of that in that drop down in the chat. Otherwise, it's just going to come to Dr. Hedgepeth and myself. And if you want to see a scrolling subtitle, you can hover over the bottom of your Zoom and select the show subtitle option if you would like to see that during this webinar presentation. Questions are welcomed in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and we will get to those as time permits. And without any further ado, I am going to pass this over to Dr. Samantha Hedgepath. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. I greatly appreciate you always. So let me get set up here. It takes just a moment. All right. Let's see here. Okay. So welcome. As you can see, this is uh, Raising Tweens Theory versus Practical. As Emily said, I am Samantha, um, and I wanted to share my personal parenting uh, journey in hopes that it will provide insight raising smaller children in today's chaotic world. I have found that some of my parenting practices have really paid off, and I want to assure you that yours will too. Tweens are considered kids that are between eight and 12 years of age because they are in between children and teenagers. It's very normal for kids this age to start moving away from being very close to their parents to wanting to be more independent, but they still need a lot of help from their parents, according to the Child Mind Institute. I don't believe that there is one size fits all philosophical approach to raising tweens because each child, even if you have 10, God bless you if you do, but even if you have 10, each child is unique as a snowflake. Among your children, you may or um, you may see similar characteristics, but trust me, uh, with a microscopic or closer look, that you will see that there are distinct differences in their personalities, preferences, and pursuits. They are all little people. Um, I will share my real life trials, triumphs, defeats, and victories of raising my tweens and beyond. So, uh, so that you don't think that I'm a talking head on a webinar <laughs> and know that I'm a real person, I'd like to share my story. And if you've been in my previous um, uh, webinars, you've seen this slide. Um, like any good story, mine starts with once upon a time, there was a prince and a princess who fell in love. After a year or so, I quit college. We dated for a while, then got married. We had two beautiful daughters of whom we are very proud. Through the years, I enjoyed going to all their field trips while they were in school. And I enjoyed a very successful career as a full-time real estate agent. We enjoyed lots of family and friends living with us always, and I do mean always. Our homes were always at capacity, but we had so much fun along the way. The grill stayed hot. We had pool and ping pong tournaments in the basement on the weekends. Unfortunately, multiple things took a turn for the worse within a three year span. The real estate market crashed. I was separated, headed for divorce, and my health took an unexpected spiral downward. I had numerous surgeries. Um, I was on a multiplicity of medications and headed for more surgeries. I have even watched myself flatline 12 to 13 times over the span of a year as a medicine administered to me in my home by first responders or in the ER brought my heart rate all the way down to a complete stop so that it can restart at a regular beat. Once my heart stopped, 
My muscles reacted and pain streaked over my body as lightning across the sky. The nurses in the local ER and ambulance drivers knew me very well. But life moves on <laughs> with lots of prayer and these two heartbeats, AKA my Lieutenant Generals, my story continues. We will talk more about these beauties later in the presentation and have them share their perspective on my parenting. So when babies arrive today in today's world, they are somewhat like blank disc. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong generation. Babies are blank with at least three terabytes of storage in the cloud and a faster processor for learning when they enter the world. They eagerly learn and absorb from their immediate environment and other exposure. As they begin to grow with experience and exposure, these little people are developing into tweens. Since we all arrive here on planet Earth the same way, why are we so different from our little people and vice versa? Why is there such a thing as a generational gap in understanding and processing? To begin, a generation is a group of people who share familiar experiences in the formative uh, years, in their teenage years, uh, formative years to teenage years. Mannheim defined a generation as a body of people born in the same span of years and sociocultural backgrounds who ultimately share the same experiences that result in unifying characteristics. From the shared events and phenomena, <clears throat> excuse me, come similar location in time, hence the emergence of similar attitudes, behaviors, and value systems as cohorts become of an adult age between 17 and 25. Mannheim did not focus on the attitudes, behaviors, and value systems that developed, but rather, but rather attributes developed, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm sorry, but rather on the attributes developed as a result of the newer generation just simply responding to the social norms and status quo of the previous generations. In other words, the attitudes, behaviors, and value systems um, of an emerging generation are the aftermath of that generation navigating and making differing decisions from the systems of the current regime. The generational cohorts are simply located in time and share collective experiences and form a collective response to the pre-existing social norms and status quo. Thus, new generations are organically conduits for change that Mannheim considered a social norm. And for example, baby boomers, we know all about baby boomers. Uh, they were stereotyped as hippies and known for uh, staying with employers for life, 30 years, you know. The new social norm force of millennials came in on the playing field of life, assessed the social norms and status quo of the at will law where employees can let you go at will. Now there's no pensions. You get no gold watch on the landscape when you retire, coupled with crazy student loans. And they change the game by changing jobs frequently for survival. Um, a generation's lens and perspectives are influenced by your position in life. So oftentimes people will say, oh, why can't they be like us? Or what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with that next generation. They're just assessing the playing field and making decisions that better benefit them. Um, just to recap, so again, new generations are organically conduits uh, for change that Mannheim considered a social force. Um, Mannheim also explained that even though many generations may experience an event at the same time, it depends upon where the generation is in their maturity cycle that will influence how they respond to the events and phenomena. So with that said, 
Sometimes to upscale our parenting, we have to raise our awareness of how external and internal elements to our homes or family units can impact how our children perceive and understand, thus creating those generational gaps. Our children are located at a more current dispensation of the time continuum. Terrorized more than ever before uh, because of the school shootings, mental and physical abuse, human trafficking, virtual bullying, mean girls, rogue boys, shaming, sexual abuse, <clears throat> the pandemic, hate groups, lack of emotional resilience, and so much more. Pregnancy rates and suicide rates are off the charts. <clears throat> Unfortunately, our children at large are not seeing their way through this maze called life, some of them. Sometimes it's not our children that are having a problem, but the problems of their friends impact them heavily. Um, like my oldest daughter, um, and you'll see her slide, I call her Lieutenant General M. Uh, she came home so heavy in her heart uh, one day and she just wasn't saying anything. So next few days went by, she was <clears throat> just very heavy in her heart. And she came to me and she said, mommy, there's a girl at school. She doesn't have a ride to prom. Can we pick her up and give her a ride to prom? And I said, sure, sweetness, we can do that. So we pull up in front of this uh, young lady's home. And when this young lady comes out, there's no smile on her face and she just looks so sad. But it took my breath when this young lady got in the car, when she got in my truck, she had cut wounds along both her arms. And it took all I had not to scream, oh my God. Because, because then my mind was racing, like what is this child going through or what's on her mind? I mean, both of her arms were covered. Um, and my daughter looked at me. So evidently my, my daughter knew she was a cutter. And um, I just put a smile on my face. I greeted her, told her how beautiful, you know, her dress was. Um, and then we just lightened the atmosphere in the truck and we went on to prom and dropped them off. And then when I picked them up and took her home, they didn't even have a, um, a front porch light on for her or anything. She walked in just darkness to get into the house. And then my daughter began to pour out how she was very troubled about this young lady and we prayed about her. So um, sometimes it's not your child, sometimes it's their friends. But as parents, we just really have to get in tune with everything that involves them so that we can kind of help navigate them through and they can help navigate their friends. So as parents, a lot of times we are the resource for their friends. So let's talk about the rift. Oh, this is so painful in the parenting process. Um, who is this tween? You know, our middle schoolers, you know, on up are faced with, like we said, the previous giants, um, you know, in addition to sex, drugs, peer pressure, with so many influences from today's society, our teens begin to form their own opinions and perspectives. You can recognize, it's like you can recognize your child one day and the next, you're wondering, who is this kid in my house? What did they do with my kid? <laughs> and it does happen. <laughs> so be encouraged. I know you are tired of repeating yourself, you know, on the good principles and precepts you want your child to know. I know it's just repeat, 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 but keep repeating. Uh, you are in the theory phase of this parenting journey. Your tweens and older are under your care. So you are loading their tool bag, what I call a tool bag with tools they will need in the real world. Yes, you, they, you, know, you are getting on their nerves. Um, you know, didn't your parent or, or guardian get on your nerves? You know, it's kind of a you know, rite of passage <laughs> to get on their nerves. So keep doing what you're doing, you know, but sometimes we just have to adjust how we, adjust how we do it and when we do it. 
but still get the message across. So this is Lieutenant General M. This is my oldest, my firstborn. I call her Dora the Explorer. <laughs> she loves going to other countries and experiencing food and culture. Uh, she's now 33, but I vividly remember when she was a tween, her screaming, mommy, you told me that already. And I screamed back, I am putting tools in your tool bag. And I would laugh and she would be so irritated with me. But I was like, uh-huh, she's gonna need that later. She can't stand it now, but she'll need it later. She would roll her eyes and walk away so frustrated because I'm probably repeating myself for the 99th hundred time. I will walk away and say, she will get it. She's gonna need that. These things are gonna haunt her in the world, but she'll be equipped to face it. So she would call a family meeting to discuss things because we allow family meetings, we allow them to talk about the things that bothered them externally and internal of our home. We wanted to teach them teamwork and um, long so long as they did it respectfully. Um, and so we would have you know the team meeting to talk about these things that bothered her, um, but it's okay. It built her communication skills at an early age, and it, it instilled teamwork, which we need in the workplace today. So one day, Lieutenant M came um, she, to me. She told me she had quit her teaching job. Ouch. Trust me, you guys. There was a lot of drama in that moment. And she was like, Mommy, don't hyperventilate. <laughs> she had quit her teaching job. She was set up really pretty. Um, she was the main teacher. She had smart boards in her own classroom. And just they were pulling her up on an administrative level, atten uh, attending county meetings and so forth and so on. And I just, it was just so promising. But then she quit um, and decided to roam Ecuador for 30 days. Oh, help me someone. Uh, she said, mommy, the only reason I am coming back is because of you, she said. She said, I know it would kill you if you didn't see me and know that I'm okay. She said, so I'll be back, mommy but I'm going to Ecuador. You know, um, she didn't know where she was going to stay. Uh, that baffled me, but they have uh, what they call in their culture hostels where you go and stay in people's homes where here, I think we call it Airbnb, <laughs> but it's really a, a way of life there. So um, I went into panic mode internally, which she knew I would do, um, but was supportive in seeing her off on the journey. Once uh, she, once we had a really bad argument, I don't even know what we were arguing about. I don't know what the issue was um, at the time. I'll say at the time for this particular example, but for two years, I did not know where she lived physically. This was after she came back from Ecuador and everything. Um, she made it back safe, um, but I didn't know where she lived for two years. We met for lunch, lunch seems like once a quarter. Uh, she was standing her ground for change in what she called my overbearing parenting skills. Um, and I understood that because my mother, God bless her, and, I, and I'm thankful for the mom I had, but she had some overbearing parenting skills. So it was kind of inherent um, operating in me like a subroutine. <laughs> but every time we had a rift, my daughter, because how we orchestrated our home, uh, she defaulted to having discussions to tease through the hard spots for resolution. The same conflict resolution tools I taught her in her tween years are foundational to how she responds to conflict today. And it works. It truly works. Um, again, we had a, something else happen. I hadn't talked to my daughter since March of last year, and we just reunited January of this year. So you'll have, it'll be reoccurring that you have tiffs, but everybody goes to their corners, <laughs> you know, until they can talk about it. And, um, and then we worked it out. We just went according to the way we've previously worked things out. And when I first saw her, uh, cause she broke her leg this January and I came to assist and when I got through the door within that first hour, I said, I just want to let you know that I'm not sure what happened, but I want to apologize for if I hurt your feelings or if I offended you or anything. And she said, no, mommy, I apologize. 
She said, I know it hurt you that we didn't talk and I don't want to hurt you. And we've just been moving forward ever since. Now, will we have a beef next month? Stay tuned. <laughs> but we have the conflict resolution in place to help us through those moments. So that's Lieutenant General M. Um, and uh, this is her in Ecuador. Um, Want to just, just share a couple of pictures. That's beside that giant tortoise. Um, and that, behind, that second picture there is the mouth of an old volcano uh, where the, the water has pooled there in Ecuador when she did take that um, hiatus and just to decompress. So this here is Lieutenant General N. Um, she is the drill sergeant of the family. <clears throat> it, you will get it. You will catch a bad one. If she finds you are out of order, if you need a shower or your uniform is not per her specs, oh, she will call you aside and get you straight. Um, growing up, I told both of them. And so when you have multiple children, you know, this is something I thought very important for all of them to know individually and collectively, um, that all of them are leaders. Um, it doesn't mean that leaders don't follow sometimes, but <clears throat> they were in middle school and I knew they were going to be faced with challenges, sex, drugs, whatever, whatever. Um, and I wanted them to know you always choose the right path. You be the leader. Even if you step out from a crowd of 100, 150, you're, <clears throat> doesn't matter, 25, however many it is, you just follow the right road. I said, and trust and believe there'll be others that will slowly peel off and follow you. Um, <clears throat> but at all times, you, you know, respect authority, follow authority, um, but in your, your peer group and everything, you just make sure you're doing the right thing and you're leaders. So I told Lieutenant General M that just because she is the younger sister does not mean she is everyone's younger sister. She is a leader too. One day, big sister <laughs> was in her room being mama, like she could do, um, telling her, telling little sister, you know, she had to clean up, yada, 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 fix her bed, yada, yada, yada. I heard my youngest tween fire off at her sister and yell, I'm a leader too, get out of my room. I was in the hallway, I had to run the other way because I was laughing so hard, but I silently celebrated in the hallway, screaming to myself, she got it, she got it. She knows she's a leader. Um, I knew she had gotten it what I was trying to instill in her that she didn't have to just follow the crowd and be off in a wrong direction, but she could make a decision for herself. So Lieutenant General M came in uh, one day from high school and she said to me, um, I'm going to dance in the NFL. And I said, okay, and I'm still just picking up clothes in the den, whatever, whatever. And she looked at me so sternly, I told you she's the drill sergeant of the family. She looked at me so sternly and she said, no, I mean it, mommy, I am going to dance in the NFL. And I stopped and I looked her dead in the eyes and I said, I believe you, do it. So not only has she danced in the NFL, she is now dancing for the NBA, <clears throat> as you can see there in the blue picture. Um, she had learned a lot quicker um, from watching her sister and I. So whenever she was not satisfied, with some of my parenting or some of her dad's parenting, she would call a family meeting or she would catch you and call you into a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and you didn't want that. You did not want that. Especially if she was right. <laughs> uh, with my, so now let's move on to the practical. Because it's because of my two uh, lieutenant generals that I understand parenting as theory and then there's practical. You know, when you had biology in college, you had the theory part and then you had the labs. So this is how this evolved. When my oldest one went to college, just it seemed random to me, but evidently she had had an epiphany. Um, she called me one day and she, she, cause she regularly called me. So I thought it was an ordinary check-in, but she said, ma, I called to say thank you. And I said, thank you for what? She was like, Ma, growing up, you got 
on my last nerve, repeating yourself. Um, she said, just repeating yourself, <laughs> repeating yourself. She said, you got on my last nerve. She said, um, but Ma, she was like, being here in college amongst my own you know, age group and everything, she said, when we go out and we encounter a dragon, she said, Ma, it's nothing for me to reach into the tool bag that you've given me and to pull out the fairy dust, sprinkle it on the dragon and the dragon disappears. She said, but what is shocking, Ma, then all my friends are looking at me like, how did you know how to do that? How, how did you how did you learn how to do that? And she was like, well, my mommy taught me. Didn't your mommy teach you? And she's just like shocked that they don't know how to do certain things. She was like, Ma, these kids are crazy. They know nothing. They know nothing, mommy. She was like, thank you for the tools you put in my tool bag. Um, and uh, when I got off the phone, that was just, I mean, I had the biggest smile on my face and my heart was so warm and I was misty eyed because I was like, she got it. She got it. And I didn't think anything about it being practical then. It was crazy, but in like manner, in three and a half years later, when my youngest one went to college, um, she called me to thank me the same way. And so it's not like it was rehearsed or anything. And she told me the same thing. She was like, ma, when they give me that ma, that northern ma, you know, ma, you got on my nerves. <laughs> she was like, but you put great tools in my tool bag. And it just, she was like, Ma, I'm just so thankful for the things that you taught me because when you get to college, you're on your own. And she was like, Ma, these kids are going wild, like no restraint. And uh, so I got misty eyed. And when we got off the phone, I said, thank you, Lord. I was screaming. She got it. She got it. Um, and it was not immediately that I divided up this parenting experience into, you know, um, theory versus practical. It was over some years that I just, as I was, I'm always find myself just talking with parents about their kids and showing them their kids are going to make it, their kids are going to remember, you know, things of that nature, being an encourager. So it was over some years and I found myself telling people the same thing. Um, I kept thinking about both of them, how it was unrehearsed. They called me at once because they had an epiphany. Um, they had, but they had to go through what we said earlier were the labs. They had to go through the practical. They're not really going through the practical while they're home. You know what I'm saying? They're getting the theory then while they're home, they're tired of hearing the theory. Like we got tired of reading that biology textbook in college. Okay. Then when we went over to the labs, to the practical, and we had to cut that frog open. <laughs> then we understood the theory because it was very hands-on then. Um, so that's how I came about with the theory versus the practical. While they're home, they're not getting the practical. But when they get out in the world, that's when they have to walk through it, figure it out, figure it out how it works for them uh, in their generation versus how it worked for us in our generation. So, love is the blueprint that evidently erodes those gaps. Yes, you are tired parents out there, but keep going. Be encouraged. What you are teaching them will pay off someday. In my parenting experience, uh, we developed like 10 or we recognized 10 practices that worked best for us. Let me get over to those practices. Oh, well. Oh, oh, nope, nope. Not going to get to the practice just yet. <laughs> um, that's on the next slide. So I need to change my notes. Um, but what I wanted to encourage you to do, it's going to work. It's really going to work what you have to tell your kids. Just try and remember what it was like when you were a kid. I am certain doggies were not taking selfies in your day, but they are now in current times. And, and things like this, our kids have to process that as a social norm, just as you did with things that shocked your parents. So I asked my daughters, uh, what did they find most helpful 
about my parenting process. So what they found uh, as the 10 best parenting processes or practices that worked for us is um, I always tried active listening and asking about their current events um, and let them talk about their day. They appreciated me showing genuine interest in their interest and passions, such as crafts and sports. Um, they appreciated that I gave them my undivided, undistracted attention. Um, I really tried to even, and I was a busy, busy real estate agent at the time. I was a multi-million dollar top producer. Um, business, I had to turn down some business. It was really a great season of my life. Um, but they appreciated me trying to have those cell phone conversations at another time, not in the middle of us crafting um, or on our Walmart uh, field trip. We loved us some Walmart. Uh, <laughs> so um, another point um, was when they were having a hard time wrestling with something, um, giving them the space uh, when they are bothered. And just letting them know, okay, well, when you're ready to talk about it, I'm here. And I'm sure most of you already do some of these things. But just sharing my empirical data from my parenting style. Um, they appreciated um, that I acknowledged their accomplishments. Um, they so appreciated that I did not compare my childhood with theirs um, because these are different times. I just, didn't want, I just didn't want to do that. I know some parents do to say, oh, well, when I was growing up, such and such and such and such, but try to keep in mind what I explained about the generational theory and that we are in different times and that they face, even if they face some of the same Goliaths, some of the same giants, they face it at a much huger magnitude, um, like school shootings. And we've never experienced a pandemic and all the stress associated with that and some of the other giants I had listed there. So they definitely live in different times. Um, they appreciated that I did not compare them to each other nor to other children, that I identified and recognized them as unique beings um, and dealt with them as such. Um, they appreciate that we gave them a little space, a platform to express themselves respectfully you know, in those one-on-one -on -one or family uh, meeting forums. Um, they appreciated that we were open to engaging with their friends and others in their social circle. They said it was important that I knew what was going on with some of their friends because then they relied on me to help with some of those friends. Like I told you about the young lady um, that didn't have a ride with the prom and it was evident that she was a cutter. Um, and there were other, many other um, of her friends that they brought home and asked for me to help and assist with them. They appreciated um, that we engaged in games or other fun activities that were just pure fun and laughter. Didn't have an objective except just pure fun and laughter. Um, and then my oldest one told me last night <clears throat> that um, probably one of the biggest points is that I, I was never afraid as a parent uh, or too proud to lead the apology, no matter who uh, was to blame. So uh, those were just our top 10 best. If you could, in the chat, please put in one of your parenting hacks because we're just sharing today. This is an open forum for all parents. Someone may have a best practice that will help another parent here in the child in the in the chat. So just quickly share a parenting tip. Uh, keep it as brief as possible in the chat. Um, what is one of your hacks that really works? Um, and I just want to say thank you, thank you so much for your time. Um, I am now open for questions, Emily. And then afterwards, Emily will read off of some of the parenting tips in the chat. Okay, great. And while we wait for um, a few questions to come in the, P, uh, the Q and A area or the chat, I did want to mention that um, Greg Masick uh, went ahead and put something in the chat—a resource that instantly popped into my mind that you may want to explore: the one-minute parent or the one-minute mother. Oh, okay, okay, I like that. Thank and you. Just wanted to 
Yeah, just wanted to share some of um, some of that as things are populating in here for questions. So I, I wanted to start with this question right off the bat. I know you mentioned one of the top 10 um, strategies that you used in parenting is recognizing that each of your children as unique human beings. Yes. And that may have affected some of the way that you did your parenting with them. Do you feel like the siblings ever get, got frustrated because they felt you treated one child a certain way over the other based off of their own characteristics and personalities? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I really do. Um, they would talk to me in those moments because remember they were allowed to have family form 101. <laughs> Um, I think, I think what I was at fault of doing, I was at fault of doing it sometimes both ways. I was at fault of treating them like twins, uh, because when they were tweens, I dressed them alike in everything. And I didn't know that until, um, Tabitha, my oldest one, uh, Lieutenant General M, she was like, mom, we're not twins. She was like, would you stop with the buying us the same outfits? Okay. Girls, you know, <laughs> so I was like, oh, nope, I got to individualize. I got to individualize um, and look at them, look at their personalities. Um, my younger is a lot more colorful, you know, lime green type thing. And then my um, oldest one, she likes brown, beige, you know, darker blues, you know, that type thing. And so when she said that to me, I was like, you know what, I got to pay attention to making sure. I treat them uniquely. She said, I'm treating them like twins. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I'm sure obviously having those family sessions with open dialogue, open, honest dialogue in a respectful way, as you mentioned, right. helped lead towards um, finding some of those things out. Um, yes, it, it really did. It, it really, really did. Because um, we freely let them talk about what bothered them because um, we wanted to know their perspective. Uh, it was really a learning curve for us. Just like I explained to them, to, to my oldest recently, I was like, when parenting, guess what? Parents are learning. I've never been the mother of, of at the time, whatever age you were. I said, now you're 33. Guess what? I've never been the mother of a 33 year old. So I'm still learning. I'll be learning to my grave. <laughs> I was like, so you're going to have to stay open with me and tell me, you know, what's the issue if I'm offensive or not, just like I would do any other relationship. Right. But I think with us parents, we tend to be, or we can be more authoritative. Right. So we have to look at our leadership style within the home. You know, if you're a dictator at work or a situational leadership or passive aggressive leadership, we may be conveying those things at home to our children. Right. Right. And so we're teaching them to be submissive to those types, whatever type of leadership we are. Let's just say that whatever type of leadership we are, then they get used to either cowering or interacting with, with whatever type of leadership we are. Um, and so we have to be mindful of that because we want them to survive out in that world, to be good teammates you know, not the hellish ones, <laughs> you know, nobody wants to work with. So we just got to teach them good citizenship by being an example of that good citizen. Absolutely. And I do, I just want to point out this just as a personal note, um, as, and then I'm going to get to some of the things here in the chat. And again, feel free to post any questions in the Q and A that you may have. Um, but I, what I personally enjoy is the idea of apology, right? Because I'm a mother, but I'm also a human being. Yeah. Um, and I know that we were briefly talking about it beforehand. And you mentioned in your webinar as well, too, just saying that you're you're sorry. Um, and I think that really does open the gate for um, just an understanding, I guess. Yeah. And I yeah. think it's really healthy. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share that. I appreciate that you do that. And as a recommendation, I appreciate that you, sh you shared that as well, too. Yeah, because I mean, there are people that would take that for granted, but there are some parents that feel like, oh, I'm very, and it's okay. I mean, everybody's style is right. different. I'm the authority. So you do what I say, not as I do type thing. But the children can see when they're smaller, they can see the difference 
in you doing what you say and what you do. They, I mean, they can just tell the differences and they're, and then they, so they see the hypocrisy. If you say this is good, but you don't do it, then why should I do it? Mm. And so then they start bucking your authority and you don't even know why, right? you know, <laughs> you don't even know why, but that's because they're, they're, they're weighing your words against your actions. actions. And when they see the hypocrisy or the difference, then they're like, Psh, later for that. You're not real. You're not keeping it real or whatever <laughs> the thing is for the current generation. Yeah. A hundred or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So I did want to share some of the um, strategies that you mentioned as you wanted some of our attendees to pop in, maybe some yeah. of their, their best strategies. Please. And Yvonne mentions, um, I have two kiddos, a 12 year old and a 13 year old boy who I take out on individual dates for one-on-one -on -one quality time. I ask them their opinions on how I'm doing as a parent, how their stepmom is doing, what they think we do well, how we can better support them. Sometimes we um, parents, sometimes we parent the way we want, but it's not th what they need. It's good to check in with them in this way, I think. I love it. Any that is on? so awesome. I love the QT time, like the one-on-one. -on -one. That's great. Yes. And I love that she takes them separately because a lot of times the oldest one feels <laughs> like they don't have a voice because the baby is always squawking or the baby may feel like they don't get enough time because the oldest one is now being a sub parent or very authoritative, you know, and they're looking just like Chelsea was like, I'm a leader too, Tab, you know. <laughs> she's, they just want, they want a voice. Everybody wants a voice. So I love that, that she takes them out individually. And I absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that. And um, someone also just mentions as a, as a mom of four, um, it's been super effective to have one-on-one -on -one time with each child. We take them out of the sibling dynamic, which mm -hmm. gets them to be with just us and express what's on their mind. So I appreciate yes. that. Awesome. Again, standing ovation for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Jessica mentions, we struggle um, though when they are so close in age, the pushing in school um, and such, but, I, but understanding their abilities, the kids don't see why we push them differently. So talking about, I think Jessica's mentioning when you have kids that are close in age, but then treating them differently. I think that's what I'm gathering from that. Any yeah. other thoughts on that? Which, yeah, which can be hard to do. My girls um, are three and a half years apart and I was treating them like twins. Right. <laughs> you know, I was treating them alike. If I bought one something, I would buy, you know, I'd buy two. And to my oldest was like, mommy, we're not twins. <laughs> and she almost crushed my heart because I don't know, in my mind, there were twins for a minute. Um, so it is hard. So it will take a little more effort not to. Um, and then, you know, I think how I tried to come out of that phase is whenever I would go shopping, I would say, okay, so I think this is a really nice dress. And I know it's going to require a lot more dialogue parents. I know you're already exhausted. You would just like to zone out yourself. I get it. Um, but it's just, a, it's just, just requires a little more dialogue because then when we would look at dresses or jeans and I was like, okay, ladies, what do you want to look at? Somebody needs a pair of jeans or should we look at dresses? And then one would say dress, one would say jeans. I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're closest to the jeans right now. So let's take that on and then we'll move over to the dresses and I just let them buy complete. But I, I asked them more questions to get to glean from them what direction this one wanted to go in and what direction this one wanted to go in. And then after a while, I'd like say when we went on our little Saturday shopping sprees at Walmart, I was like, everybody get your own cart, see you at the register, bye. <laughs> like, don't bother me, I got my own cart. A <laughs> um, couple of other great parenting things in here that I wanna share. Um, I, I want to say this because I think it's something um, I, I think it's really applicable to, to, to today in the modern world. I've learned that I have to be very careful about my own screen time because it is easy to get distracted 
as a parent from a place of reaction versus being proactive. And I, I want to say screen time in both TV, computer, cell phone, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How often are we looking at those when our children are around us and just being cognizant of that? Yeah, no, I agree. I, that's a perfect parenting tip um, because they're looking for your undivided attention. Remember, that was one of my things. They're looking uh, for you to be off that cell phone, not looking at, not saying, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I mean, they can deal with that a little bit, of course, because that's reality. Right. But at some point, make them feel special. See, as parents, we can make our kids feel so special. Like they're, you know, superheroes and princesses and all of that, you know, and it's important that we set that foundation and make them feel like that because when they go out into the world, the world's going to beat them up. The world's going to kick them around like an old tin can and they have to know that they have a safe place with their parent. Absolutely. And oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, darling. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you were done there with that. It sounded like a great end of statement. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No and problem. this this ties into Loretta's comment about um, telling your child that you love them unconditionally, right? That's right. Because no matter what they do, even if they're terrible in their tween years, like, <laughs> like maybe I was. <laughs> too. <laughs> that it's so facto, there's my apology to my mother when I was a grown woman. But um, I, I, I think knowing that, saying it actually to them is very helpful as you mentioned right mm -hmm. they need to know yeah. right they do they need to know it and uh, that gives them again gives them that confidence to step mm -hmm. out into the world because again the world's going to kick you around like an old tin can it's going to try you it's going to test your principles and what your parents taught you so you got to know you can come home and even if you feel like you tanked you can still get a thumbs up from your parents doesn't mean that parents don't give you some feedback right. but you can still get a thumbs up and get that support that backup unit you know <laughs> when the world is kicking you around <laughs> exactly and i think that's too as you're as we as our focus here is on tweens um you obviously some of this stems from the younger ages as well too right oh so, yeah it covers um, all ages, actually, because it just never stops, right? You know, it just never stops. And so you're laying the foundation, especially at the tween age. Absolutely. Um, you're, you're, that's when you're laying that foundation for when they go into high school and those harder places in life. Mm. Absolutely. And I, it, it just makes me think about, you mentioned the words that you say and the actions that you say. So I'm thinking about just, you know, my little, my little kiddos. And when I have to have a conversation, um, this is a thing that I like that one of my strategies, when I have to have a conversation, that's going to be maybe what they don't want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, I find because of my height and their height, I, just taking physicality into um, a strategy as parenting, right? So I try to get down on their level so that yeah. I'm eye to eye with them. Yeah. Um, there's something about that, that they seem to be more receptive to yeah. whatever my feedback is, if I'm on their level, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, you know what? I was reading an article once where they were talking about even within the classroom, that is a good approach mm -hmm. instead of being the lecturer, just a lecturer at the front, but find a way if the, if the classroom is small enough to have a round table or team setting, uh, to where it's inclusive of the instructor with the students and everybody, it gives the people or gives the students or the child comfort level, like you were saying, and to know that you're on their level. Absolutely. And that's kind of, uh, uh, Greg mentions, creating a safe space um, for, for our children as well, too. That's correct. That's correct. We've got some great parents online here today. <laughs> I love got, it. They've got some good strategies to share. Yes. And I do. And the, I have to say, Tiffany mentions that her boys are now 20 and 21 and they call every day. Sometimes <laughs> the youngest calls three times per day. <laughs> She's a good mom. They're, they, they're staying connected. Oh you my know? goodness. Cause it's hard when the little birdie leaves the nest. 
but so long as they call back and stay connected. Yes, and this is an interesting piece here too as well. Just someone mentioned that right now they um, don't have children, but the parents were quite authoritative when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. This affected my relationship with them, especially with my mother, because I felt I couldn't be open with her. It's still sometimes even difficult as an adult though. I see where she changed in some ways. However, I am still reserved with her, especially if I worry about how she will judge or react to me. So any thoughts on that? I mean, these yeah. interactions affect us into our adulthood. It really does actually, because my mother was very authoritative. It was her way of the highway. She was a traditionalist born um, the year of the great depression. Um, she grew up on a farm. She was the baby of five. Um, and so it was, um, I was not very open with my mom, but it was because of my experience with my mom, why I was very proactive and sensitive to certain things about my girls. I wanted to be the opposite of what my mom, and I knew my mom probably didn't mean any harm or anything. You, people can only give what they were given. You know, you, they can only give what was deposited into them, that you can't go to the bank and pull out money you don't have, you know? Right. <laughs> You can only get what you deposit in there. I wish um, I could, but yeah. Like, oh, I'd go and pull a million today if I could. Um, but, you know, they, they just, they, they're just dealing, some parents, because that's what was deposited into them. That's all they have to give. And so I completely get that. But that's what inspired me to not compare. I only heard my mom compare me to somebody else, I think once or twice. But I remember it grated my nerve so bad. I was like, if I ever have children, I will never compare them ever. And, you know, that's interesting that you mentioned that. I, I know you talked about the generational piece as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it could be said that we are learning more as time goes on and we're learning better parenting strategies. I mean, that could be said, right? Yeah, it's an active process. Right. Yeah, you never cap out. Like I was saying with my daughter who's 33, I was like, I've never been the parent of a 33-year-old. And when she turns 34, I've never been the parent of a 34-year-old. Work with me. You know, <laughs> let me know if I'm still doing some things that grate your nerves, because I'm gonna let you know if you're grating mine, you know. <laughs> so um, and, and part of my yeah, part of her feedback is like, Ma, sometimes it's just the way you say things. So I'm mm -hmm. working on polishing my delivery. But my mom was very rough. It was just cut dry, black and white. That's it, you know. So I've had to, I've, all these years and I'm still working on how to polish my delivery because I only know how to give it to you. So whatever is neat and, you know, knives and needles and pins, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I clean up the carnage later, you know. So I'm working on that part of me. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate your honesty because I, you know, I just think that that actually is, is a wonderful piece of just being a human, right? It's just work human in human. progress. <laughs> yep. work. You're constant. And that's how you continue to grow. That's how you get a, a healthy influx and in, 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 uh, it was an influx. And I can't even think of another word, but anyway, ingress, egress, um, right. ex whatever in and out um, is because you constantly learn. And so when you're not learning and adapting, you're stagnant. Right. You're just water standing still, collecting mosquitoes and stuff. <laughs> You're no, <collecting> thank you. <laughs> just, just algae percolating everywhere. Algae, <laughs> and funk, because you're not you're not taking in, you're not releasing. So continue. I encourage everyone to stay growing. Stay growing. Absolutely. And I I want to thank all of our attendees, by the way. Thank you so much for some of your parenting uh, strategies that you use as well, too. And um, just so everyone knows, of course, we are going to have Dr. Hedgepeth come back again. We are hoping in the August timeframe. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do want to say uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hedgepeth. We really appreciate you and all of your time and sharing your experiences and your strategies, because again, we are working on the flow, intake and outtake here. That's so right. that's right. 
Thank you so much, Emily. You're always such a gracious host on behalf of uh, North Central University. Thank you. Um, I always enjoy, I, I feel like Emily and I, guys, Emily and I are the dynamic duo. <laughs> <laughs> We have, we definitely have a great relationship and I, and we love working with you here and we're yeah. super proud that you're one of our alumni as well. So that's right. And so my website is there. If anyone has any questions or if you want to just shoot me more suggestions on parenting, cause like, I'm definitely going to buy that book one minute parenting. Um, but there's my email address, my QRC code, just feel free to reach out to me. Absolutely. And thank you so much. And until we see you all, I hope you have a great rest of your day and take care.